wonder uh, why I got interested in, uh, uh, from a background of pediatrics into medical marijuana. And um, just so you all understand, I'm not a, um, uh, what do you call it, a naturopath. I'm not a uh, uh, herbalist. I'm a medical doctor who believes in evidence-based medicine, you know. Um, uh, for many years, we've been somewhat lied to by the federal government that there's no evidence behind uh, cannabis. And uh, until uh, Sanjay Gupta gave a, a, a real good uh, uh, program, anybody in the audience watch the program by Sanjay Gupta? Um, he's a very well-known uh, uh, journalist uh, working for, uh, I think it was NBC at the time, uh, and he, sh he initially was very anti-marijuana uh, and watched how some people were doing, um, kids were responding to cannabidiol, CBD, which is a cannabinoid in the plant. I watched that program and I was like floored, you know, as a medical doctor, who's pediatric based, that this could have such a profound impact. And it was marijuana. And so I said, if this is something that Sanjay Gupta endorses, I want to know more. And I started doing, you know, a couple of years of reading to see what true evidence was there and uh, found that there was significant evidence. And uh, once uh, medical marijuana was approved in 2016, um, uh, I said, I think I want to learn more about this and maybe just walk away from peds for a little while and uh, eventually go back to peds. I'm still a board certified pediatrician uh, and I still see kids, uh, but I'm doing this on my days. So this is my new day job. Um, a short history of uh, marijuana. Uh, most ancient cultures didn't grow the plant to get high, but as an herbal medicine, likely starting in Asia around 500 BC, it was mostly uh, uh, an edible at that time and it had herbal you know benefits uh in the early 1600s virginia massachusetts connecticut colonies required farmers to grow hemp uh hemp fiber was used to make clothing paper uh sails for boats rope seeds were good were used as food because it's a fast growing plant that's easy to cultivate and has many uses hemp was widely grown throughout colonial america and at Spanish missions in the Southwest. And I don't know if our prior speaker talked a little bit about that uh, or not, but CBD has been a, uh, or not CBD, but hemp has been a, uh, uh, a plant that has been used for many, many years, long before we got into the prohibition years. So in the 1830s, an Irish doctor, Sir William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, uh, found that cannabis extracts could help lessen stomach pain and vomiting in people suffering from cholera. So that was literally America's first introduction of the medical indications for cannabis. Uh, it seemed to relieve inflammation in the gut at that time. Uh, by the late 1800s, cannabis extracts were sold in pharmacies and doctor's offices throughout Europe and the United States to treat stomach problems and other ailments. Scientists later discovered that tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, was the source of marijuana's medicinal properties, mainly to lessen nausea and promote hunger. It was also discovered to have psychoactive properties. In the United States, marijuana wasn't widely used for recreational purposes until the early 1900s. Mexicans that immigrated to the United States during this time, post-Mexican Revolution, introduced the recreational practice of smoking marijuana uh, to the American culture. And it turns out when it's uh, heated, uh, THC converts into an active metabolite called Delta-9 THC, which actually gives uh, cannabis its psychoactive uh, properties. Am I boring anybody yet? Uh, during the Great Depression, resentment of, medical, of Mexican immigrants propagated public feel of the evil weed as a result and consistent with the Prohibition's era uh, view of all intoxicants. Uh, 29 states had outlawed cannabis by 1931. Uh, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 was the first federal U.S. law to criminalize marijuana. The act imposed an excise tax on the sale, possession, and transfer of all hemp products, effectively criminalizing all but industrial uses of the plant. 
Industrial hemp continued to be grown in the United States throughout World War II, and the last U.S. hemp fields were planted uh, in 1957 in Wisconsin. As part of the War on Drugs, the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, uh, signed into law by President Richard Nixon, repealed the Marijuana Tax Act and listed marijuana as a Schedule I drug. Uh, it was during Nixon's era that uh, he started to schedule drugs. Scheduled drugs one through five had different uh, uh, abuse properties. Schedule one is considered the most uh, uh, egregious or the most abusive of products, listed with LSD, ecstasy, uh, no medicinal properties, high chance of addiction. Uh, heroin is in that class also, no medical uses, and a high potential for abuse. In 1972, a report from the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse released a report titled Marijuana, a Signal of Misunderstanding. The report recommended partial prohibition and lower penalties for possession of small amounts of marijuana. This was an evidence-based paper uh, based on review articles from medical professionals and the medical professionals trying to advise Nixon's um, uh, staff uh, recommended against uh, pr complete prohibition and maybe partial prohibition and regulation, and Nixon and other governmental officials ignored the report's findings. And if you kind of go back to the political era at that time, it had a lot to do with the war on hippies, you know? And uh, Nixon was, you know, conservative, built on the military, people were coming back they, from war, uh, everything was anti-war at that time, and so he said, no, I'm not going to give people this permission to use this, uh, this product. So it was, you know, not born in uh, the whole uh, medical evidence, it was born out of prohibition and born out of uh, this uh, kind of alienation and discrimination and misunderstanding. And so. Um, there was, uh, uh, so marijuana is still illegal under U.S. federal law 50 years later after Nixon era, and they can't agree on anything in Congress, uh, even though uh, they've tried to uh, lessen the scheduling of uh, Schedule 1 down to Schedule 2 many times, uh, but it's just failed in this country. Uh, to this date, still listed as a Schedule 1 drug according to the federal government. The tide is shifting. Uh, California, in the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, became the first state to legalize marijuana for medicinal use by people with severe or chronic illnesses. Colorado became the first state in 2012 to legalize recreational marijuana. Washington State followed shortly thereafter. And now uh, we have 33 legal states in the country for some medical uses of marijuana. This includes THC and CBD. Uh, and legal recreationally in 11 states. And so we call it recreational or adult use. You know, it's not always, you know, recreation. Some people just can purchase for the use uh, uh, in 32 states. So the green states are the ones that are legalized for recreational and uh, medicinal marijuana. The blue states uh, also include legalized medical marijuana. And there are more legislations going on uh, uh, Indiana and Kentucky are trying to get uh, things passed, but it's in the legislature. Indiana is a tough state when it comes to uh, conservative politics. Um, Ohio House Bill 523. That's the law that was passed in September 8th of 2016. That gave uh, Ohio two years to develop an MMCP program, the Medical Marijuana Control Program. It gave the state two years to develop the framework the MMCP would allow people with certain medical conditions upon the recommendation of an Ohio licensed physician certified by the state medical board to purchase and use medical marijuana. Uh, creates a standard of care for the state medical board and the CTR physicians who are trained uh, and licensed uh, have to follow that standard of care. So that's a little bit about the state's program. The state's program went live in September of 2018, and the first dispensary in Ohio that started to deliver THC-based products opened in January. Um, and uh, it, the, the program has just been so slow to develop. 
uh, Guapacaneta, which is our closest dispensary uh, and where my practice is, uh, opened uh, in July of 2019. So again, a very slow process, very frustrating for a lot of people with medical indications. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, and I apologize, I'm going to move quickly because I understand this crowd is not necessarily medical. Uh, so there are two uh, endogenous uh, arachidonate-based lipids, anandamide and 2-AG. They're known as the endocannabinoids and are physical, physiologic ligands for the cannabinoid receptors. There are enzymes that are part of the endocannabinoid system uh, that synthesize and degrade the endocannabinoids, such as fatty acid amide and monoglycerol lipase. And then there are a couple receptors that are important that actually bind to tetrahydrocannabinol, CB1 and CB2. These are located in the central and peripheral nervous system. The CB1 receptor is concentrated on neurons that are located in the brain and throughout the body. So uh, people with neuropathy seem to get activation uh, with THC. But remember, the endocannabinoid system is not to receive THC. The endocannabinoid system is part of our body's physiology. It's built in, you know. So uh, the plant, which I'm going to get to in the next slide here, um, well, first, let's talk about where these receptors are located. The CB1 receptor is located on the brain and the neurons. The CB2 receptor is located more on the organs. So there are many organs of the body that actually have um, uh, receptor sites, brain, heart, teeth, stomach, skin, bowels, kidney, liver, lung, eye. Basically, there's a, there are a bunch of areas of the body that receive uh, anandamide and 2-AG. And this is, these have been discovered, you know, over time. Uh, and as the, we get more sophisticated in physiology, we're able to find where these receptors are located. Understanding where the receptors are located also helps to understand how uh, these endocannabinoids work on our body. So what are the phytocannabinoids? Now, phyto is the Latin root for plant. So a plant-based cannabinoid. So there are cannabinoids that actually trick our body's endocannabinoid system into thinking that they're anandamide or 2-AG. And the most uh, common cannabinoid is the uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. So phytocannabinoids are secondary plant metabolites that bind to and activate the cannabinoid receptors. Delta-9 THC is the most widely studied compound. THC is a partial agonist with high affinity to CB1 and CB2 receptors. The CB2 receptors tend to be concentrated on uh, the uh, immune system organs, so the spleen. Uh, they're located in the GI tract, and this is what reduces inflammation and probably why THC was so effective against things like cholera, things that were involved with the GI tract. Uh, CBD or cannabidiol is another hemp plant metabolite, and this is the one getting a lot of press. Uh, does not bind with high affinity to or significantly activate either cannabinoid receptor directly. So we know that cannabidiol does something in the body, but what we do know is that it doesn't activate the CB1 receptor. So the CB1 receptor is located on neurons and the brain. It's what causes the psychoactive high that we get, the dopamine release in the brain and CBD doesn't activate it. So it is non-psychoactive, but it does have properties as we saw in Sanjay Gupta's program about how, it, how children responded to it that had severe seizure disorder. So there are other plants uh, that I'm not gonna go into that, other, that also produce cannabinoids. So, so marijuana is not the only plant that makes cannabinoids basically. The effects of cannabinoids on the body. So there is an analgesic property, reduction of pain. There is an antiemetic property, reduction of nausea and vomiting. There's an antioxidant property, so it has to do with something that prevents uh, uh, irregular cells. Antioxidants are important in uh, uh, cell regulation, destroying bad cells. 
neuroprotective. So we know that the CB1 receptor has something to do with uh, neural injury and it can actually help with neural injury. And also anti-inflammatory. So it reduces inflammation through the CB2 receptor. Neuromodulatory, this is where the anti-seizure property works in cannabidiol. Um, control of cell growth and differentiation. There's been a lot of research about uh, cancer uh, and anti-proliferative uh, cancer properties. And we know that the, uh, the uh, system, the endocannabinoid system, has a lot to do with cell growth and differentiation. And so there are anti-tumor properties. They're just not studied very well, and so we'd love to study them more if our federal government would give us more permission. Um, mood enhancing, obviously, if you activate the CB1 receptor, you get a high, and uh, especially if you get enough of it. Um, it releases dopamine in the brain. It can be sedating, so many people will use uh, cannabinoids for relaxation. Oh, I got one more before that picture. Uh, and there it is, appetite stimulating. So everybody knows about the munchies, you know, um, and so uh, it seems to improve appetite, especially in cancer patients uh, that are suffering. We call it uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea. They lack appetite, they lack, uh, or they have intense amount of uh, nausea, and that's why uh, uh, cannabinoids or phytocannabinoids have often been used in cancer. Way before these medical marijuana uh, states started to approve it, the pharmaceutical companies were developing products that actually had medicinal properties and they were approved by the FDA. Does anybody know the name of the first product that was created from the plant? Synthetically though, it's called Marinol. Marinol. So Marinol is an actual pill that you can get through pharmaceutical companies, very expensive, but still there were properties that the FDA said we'll allow the pharmaceutical companies to produce them, but we won't let people have access to them unless you go through the FDA. Uh, state of Ohio's qualifying conditions. So every state is different. The program of the medical marijuana control program is state specific. So in our state, the state approved 21 conditions. Uh, so the um, uh, doctors like me who are certificate to recommend have to approve you based on one of these medical conditions. Uh, or uh, a doctor, say a GI doctor, could get their certificate to recommend and then for those patients that have Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, or other inflammatory bowel disease, they could also be a CTR physician. So the 21 conditions include AIDS uh, or a positive status for HIV, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, this has to do with its neuroprotective property, like we had stated that property before. Uh, cancer. Cancer is, is, is kind of interesting because the state did not put chemotherapy-induced nausea. They put cancer. So it, they left it very vague. So if somebody has a diagnosis of cancer, if they have anxiety about uh, getting cancer again, they would be approved, you know, even though the properties might not be evidence-based. Uh, so if somebody had beaten breast cancer, but they're so nervous and anxious about it coming back, they could be approved to use cannabis for the anti-proliferative anti, uh, properties and the antioxidant properties of the plant. Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and ulcerative colitis. Those are inflammatory uh, bowel diseases. Uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is basically your football, you know, chronic injuries, chronic concussive injuries. We know that uh, cannabis has a neuroprotective property, seems to help with Lou Gehrig's disease and uh, uh, help with uh, CTE. Epilepsy or other seizure disorder, uh, we've touched on that. Fibromyalgia is a, well, does anybody know what fibromyalgia is? or have anybody that's in the family that has been as exposed to it. It's a very difficult diagnosis to make because there's not a lot of tests that can be done. It tends to be uh, a diagnostic-based uh, 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 diagnosis uh, and a diagnosis of exclusion. When you rule out rheumatologic diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus and things like that, then you can come to a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. We believe that fibromyalgia has, is some type of neuropathic condition or upregulation of the neurons, and because 
can, uh, uh, the phytocannabinoids can trigger the CB1 receptor, they can affect neuropathy. And so we see a big improvement in people with fibromyalgia who uh, are able to use uh, medical marijuana. These are all things that are only THC helps, not CBD, correct? Uh, no, both. So remember, CBD works differently than THC. THC works on the CB1 receptor and the CB2 receptor, but CBD, when the medical marijuana program started in 2016, when they went to the state medical board and they said, what are some conditions that medical marijuana has some evidence behind? CBD was the cannabinoid that helped a lot of these conditions. Like epilepsy is not treatable with THC. Epilepsy is treated with cannabidiol. So this ran into, the, the state ran into a lot of problems because they wanted CBD to be regulated. And then the Ohio Farm Bill came through and legalized cannabidiol because it was non-psychoactive. Ohio fought it. They wanted it to only go through the dispensaries and they lost. And now CBD can be purchased uh, practically anywhere, you know. Uh, glaucoma is one controversial diagnosis because the American Ophthalmologic Association does not approve it because it seems to only have a very transient drop in the anterior chamber blood pressure uh, or pressure in the anterior chamber. And so if people were getting approved for uh, uh, glaucoma then, and they only wanted to use marijuana, they probably would go blind. You know, so it's, it's something that CTR physicians should be very educated about. Even though glaucoma is approved, it's not something you would want to stop your drops for. You know, the drops work better, you know, and they work 12 hours. So, uh, you know, reduce your pressure and get your weed card, I guess. But uh, uh, I've only approved two people for glaucoma, and it's very hard to tell them, hey, the a American Academy of, of uh, Ophthalmology says don't use this. Uh, as your sole product and they're like well i'm not intending on stopping my drops but i want my card and you can't stop them necessarily if, if the risks are not outweighed by the benefits all right we got a few more hepatitis c is another one hepatitis c was treated in 2016 before Har before harvoni came out and now we have better treatment for hepatitis c than we used to. We used to have medications called interferon and other uh, uh, antiviral medications to attack it. And those medications caused a lot of physiologic symptoms, intense nausea and vomiting. And so cannabis was approved for the anti-nauseal properties of hepatitis C, but it does not cure hepatitis C. So you have to be very outright and in front of people. Uh, does anybody know how you get hepatitis C? Blood. So it's same as AIDS. So you would uh, typically be an IV drug user. So this creates a conflict. Here you are, an IV drug user with a history of heroin, and you want a marijuana card. You know? So I go through a lot of conflicts about that you know, and giving the recommendation for people who are IV drug users. MS, multiple sclerosis, has the most evidence behind it in terms of the physiologic improvement in muscle spasticity that people with MS have. So a, some 40% reduction of uh, muscle tightness and spasticity. Uh, and surprisingly, I don't have more people uh, with MS. I do have about a dozen. Is that a, more of a CBD or a THC? That is more of a THC. Uh, clearly, that it has to do with the CB1 receptor and reducing the tightness because MS is in the brain. It it's affects the neurons, and that's why CB1 is important. And you're not going to activate those specific receptors with CBD. But a very good question because, again, you kind of have to know how this endocannabinoid system works and how the phytocannabinoids work so you can educate people what's the best one to use. Um, Pain that is either chronic and severe or intractable pain. Now, by far, this is my number one diagnosis. Pain exists. People want treatment of pain. The problem is, is when you treat chronic pain with an opioid, you create addiction, which was 
somewhat of a big lie from the pharmaceutical companies. I know you guys have all heard about it because we have an opioid epidemic. So we have a lot of patients that are being recommended by pain specialists to go on medical marijuana instead of an opioid, especially when people want to steer away from opioids or they have family history of addiction they want to avoid. Uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, the tremor, something called dyskinesia, which painful spasm movements seem to be uh, inhibited by uh, activation of the CB1 receptors. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, probably our second most common diagnosis, and again, where there's a lot of evidence. But where is our PTSD the most concentrated? Veterans. And who are veterans taken care of? The VA. And the VA happens to be a federally managed organization. But in 2018, they started a very big study on marijuana because uh, so many veterans were using weed. Uh, and they're saying that if they were using this medicinally and the states are getting behind it, we need to study this and find out if it's an effective way of managing uh, the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's number two. I have so many PTSD patients uh, that qualify and get therapeutic uh, responses. Sickle cell anemia causes chronic severe pain, and uh, so that could go under pain or uh, sickle cell, but if you have sickle cell disease, it's a way to keep people off of opioids. Um, spinal cord disease or injury, and remember uh, cannabis' um, uh, improvement with um, uh, neuronal repair and neuromodulation, and so that's why we get help with the tightness of muscles from spinal cord disease or spinal cord injury. Tourette syndrome is a disorder of tics, but it's also a disorder of obsessive compulsive disease. And um, so it seems, it doesn't necessarily stop the tics, but it seems to stop the OCD and reduce anxiety. So it has some benefits there. So I've had a few with TS uh, come in. And then there's traumatic brain injury. Uh, this is a difficult one because a lot of people come in as uh, you know, stroke victims, but unfortunately stroke is not traumatic brain injury. It's brain injury due to vascular uh, condition. And I think that people with vascular injury would benefit from cannabis, just like Alzheimer's and dementia patients do. But um, uh, TBI was listed and the state did not approve vascular stroke. symptoms? I don't know the answer to that. You know, in terms of cure, um, I, I would say like, does aspirin cure clots? No, I have a clotting disorder. But does aspirin treat the clots? Yes. You know, it stops the clots from happening. So cannabis, to me, is not really a cure for anything that I know of. You know, even with Lou Gehrig's disease, we see so much dramatic improvement of patients who have Lou Gehrig's, you'd want to think it's a cure. No, they will eventually succumb to it. But it seems to prolong the progress of the disease dramatically. Um, but, you know, with time and research, maybe we'll learn more. So why is our federal government so tied up against the study of it? It is so difficult to get grant money if you don't have the Fed's approval. And that grant money is what runs universities to do studies. Even keeping marijuana, the federal government has so much restrictions when it comes to you got to keep it in a safe, you've got to study, you can't take this amount, you have to have it quantified. P studies don't want to get done. You know, basically, there's so much pressure against universities to not do this. You know, but slowly, like I said, the tide is shifting. You've got uh, states like Missouri, states like uh, uh, Denver, uh, I'm sorry, like Colorado and Denver. They're asking for this now because the state says we want to do these studies. And now, the, uh, you know, these universities are saying we're going to we're going to more aggressively approach this uh, through the federal government. 
We actually have a pharmaceutical company uh, in Europe that actually came out with a CBD product called Epidiolex. That's what kids are being treated with that have Dravet syndrome and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. That is that se severe seizure disorder. So the federal government did approve Epidiolex. Um, and now you've got a lot of CBD products out there that are not carefully regulated because of the farm bill. Uh, it just has to have a lower amount of THC in it. Uh, so you bet you pharmaceutical companies want to study cannabis. You bet you they do. Uh, and they allowed to? No, they're not allowed because it's still Schedule 1. You can't study. You can't, you can't go against the federal government and say, uh, we want to license cannabi cannabidiol or you want to license uh, THC when it's listed as a psychoactive compound that the federal government says that there's no, remember to be a schedule one you have to have a high chance of addiction and you have to have no medical indications and that's what the feds are saying about medical marijuana. How are they allowed to work with op opioids then? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> We ask that question every single day. I have an opioid addict that comes in and wanting to use cannabis instead of opioids. But it has to do with political pressure and a lie. It was a big lie. You know, morphine was the first opioid that was uh, approved. They didn't know it was addictive. So what did they do? They started to make Dilaudid. Then they started to make hydrocodone. They, then they started to make fentanyl. You know, it's just so illogical. The pharmaceutical companies knew about the addictive potential. They just kept switching the ball and getting FDA approval. And, you know, ask yourself in a capitalistic society, how do people get elected? You know, there's a lot of money behind getting these things. So does the pharmaceutical industry want to see med medical marijuana rescheduled? You betcha they do, because they know that there's a lot of potential. Does anybody know the country that wants it the most? Canada. Canada legalized marijuana. They have big companies now that are producing. I think the, the, the estimate is with all of the states that are allowing uh, medical marijuana programs, they're growing 1 20th of what Canada's growing. So you think those companies want to see it legalized? They will have the jump on any U.S. companies, you know, because they'll have production, you know. They'll have product available, you know. They'll be able to get it in pill form and other forms for people to use. They're going to kill us economically. Uh, the forms and the methods of administration. This is what the state of Ohio's medical marijuana control program has legalized. Um, vaping, not smoking. So plant materials, oils, or solid preparations, they will sell, but they do not allow smoking. So you can't burn uh, flour, even though I use the term flour. Flour is basically the part of the medical marijuana plant that is the highest in THC concentration. So people take the leaves of things and then they look for the flower and the flower looks like, um, oh, what's a good, it looks like a ball of cotton, you know, like, uh, you know, just a little, you know, kind of a tight ball of growth. It's what smells like skunkweed. It's what has all the, you know, the, the, the properties in it. But when you burn it, you convert THC from an inactive uh, uh, cannabinoid, phytocannabinoid, into delta-9 THC. But burning it, you don't have to burn it. All you have to do is heat it. So this is where vaping has occurred. So people learned that if you heat it below 350 degrees, you don't get the ca uh, carcinogenic, carcinogenic effect of benzene and other um, carcinogens created during combustion. It's kind of like campfires, you know? Uh, it's kind of like barbecuing, you know? If you scald your meat, you're creating carcinogens. We know that about, you know, bar nobody's gonna stop the South from barbecuing. So. <laughs> uh, edibles, uh, this is where, you know, are become very popular. Gummies, butters, capsules, drinks, candies, sprays, and oils. Uh, so you take the, medical marijuana plant 
And then the state of uh, Ohio has allowed uh, cultivators. They're the ones that are allowed to grow marijuana. And by the way, medical marijuana has to be grown in an enclosed area. So if you see a field and you're like, oh, that's weed, it is not the MMCP that's growing it there. You know, so it's all enclosed. So enclosed, and I know people, you know, who drive I-75 I see that big, you know, growing area. That's not marijuana. You can't, you, in any of these cultivations, you can't see through the building. You have no, no ability to know that it's medical marijuana that's grown there. Um, so you take medical marijuana, uh, the plant, and you process it. Those are called the processing points. There, I think there are three approved processors in Ohio right now, but there are four, five licensed, but two are still not on board yet. And then the MMCP licensed testing, and there are two testing facilities that can actually quantify the amount of THC and the amount of CBD. So basically every product that comes out is quantified at the dispensaries for the percentage or milligrams of THC and the percentage and milligrams of CBD. So you know what you're getting basically from an Ohio dispensary. Tinctures are basically drops. Uh, they're concentrated. They can be put in the mouth sublingually. Uh, they're uh, a little bit more expensive than edibles, but they work faster. Edibles can take up to two hours to get to peak. When you vape, cannabis and heat it, it takes about 15 minutes to get to peak. So people who are having a lot of pain, cancer patients, they prefer to vape. People who are like against inhaling anything, they use edibles. PTSD patients love edibles because they have difficulty with sleep. They take an edible before bed and they're able to sleep. Tinctures go under that category, but they work a little faster, get to peak uh, a little bit quicker than two hours. Then you have patches, lotions, and creams. This is a little bit controversial because in order to cross the skin barrier, you have to be aqueous. You know, you have to be alcohol-based. If you try to get something to absorb that's greasy, it sits on the skin. And remember, cannabis, when it's extracted, is an oil. So it's a grease. So it tends to not want to go across the skin barrier. So we would love it if salves would work better, but they seem to have a hard time getting through to the skin. So like when people come in with like degenerative disc disease and severe back pain, they wanna have something they can put on them that will go through and absorb uh, and work right at the area of pain so they don't have to experience the psychoactive effect of THC. So, uh, but patches are now coming out at dispensaries and people love them they're working and they work for 24 to 36 hours um, and but they're expensive about ten dollars a patch for a thc patch there's a process to obtain an ohio card uh, most uh, certificate to recommend physicians that are doing uh, the, the practice of this need evidence of a qualifying condition. So you gather the documents validating your qualifying medical condition. Uh, so if you have Alzheimer's disease, we need to, that to be diagnosed usually by a neurologist, MRIs, etc. Schedule an appointment with a CTR physician. They will review the ORS report. Your ORS report is basically uh, what scheduled medications are you using? So we want to know, you know, is somebody on Percocets and Vicodin and, you know, do we have to have a discussion about co-use? Uh, cannabis should not really be used with an opioid because they both release dopamine in the brain. And so you have to worry more about potentiation of the opioid so it can actually be higher in the bloodstream. Uh, and then it also should not be used with benzodiazepines like Xanax, uh, 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 Alprazolam, Valium, those kind of things at the same time. Again, you get a dopamine pathway. But I didn't want to go into too much of the medicine in this talk. Uh, if the CTR physician agrees that the benefits outweigh the risks, they will enter you into the Ohio Registry. The Ohio Registry is a digital program. Uh, nobody gets a laminated card mailed to them. Uh, it's all a digital program, and you're able to, once you get on the website, you can download your card. You can print a card if you want, um, but you don't have to. A lot of people now use smartphones, and they just take a snapshot, and there's a QR code on the card that people, the dispensaries can scan and let you in. The fee for the state uh, MNCP program is $50 
uh, for a patient and then caregivers are charged half of what the patient pays. Uh, there are two discounts that the state will give patients. One is if you are on SSI or SSDI and you provide those documents, you submit them to the, we submit them to the state for you. And then we, they reduce the cost to $25. Also veterans that are honorably discharged also get a reduction. Uh, and the reduction actually helps patients afford uh, cannabis also. So there are discount coupons at the uh, 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 dispensaries. All right, that's my practice, Medical Cannabis of Northwest Ohio. Um, I do have some business cards if people need them or if they have family that they want to give this to uh, to see if they qualify. Um, there are not a lot of CTR physicians. There are something like uh, 10 to 50,000 <laughs> practitioners in Ohio. There are only 550 CTR physicians. And uh, a lot of it has to do with doctors who want to get a CTR, but because they're tied to federal money, they're blocked. Uh, the, the, the hospitals won't let them because they're, they receive Medicare, and so doctors shy away from getting their CTR certificate. I'm a pediatrician, never tied to federal government uh, Medicare program, so I was able to uh, get a CTR and not worry about uh, reimbursement. Questions? I, I moved through this quickly. What about uh, women that are pregnant or anything? Is that, uh, Pre uh, fetuses do not like uh, cannabis. Uh, THC, uh, so there are some evidence-based studies that show that THC has some negative deleterious effects. So when do you think is the most popular time that people use weed? We're sitting in one right now, yeah. college campuses, you know? So marijuana has been a recreational product on ca college campuses, but it turns out that the young brain, the brain under 23, is still doing a lot of wiring when it comes to uh, uh, systems of our brain that help us look around corners, help us see the future. And so I worry about people getting you know, short-term memory loss. We know that THC works on the hippocampus of the brain and the amygdala of the brain. Those are important parts of the brain that are still very young and growing. That's why the younger you are, the more emotional you are. That's why the younger you are, uh, you have trouble, you know, seeing the consequences of texting and driving. They need their brain to mature. We shouldn't put them on THC that can cause compromise with that. So the benefits really have to outweigh the risks because we have to have a good conversation about risks when we're talking about uh, kids. And fetuses, their brain is just developing. So as long as, um, uh, you know, whenever I approve a uh, woman that's of childbearing age, I give them a handout on the risks of cannabis and THC to their fetus, their unborn child. Uh, so they gotta stop. You got a lot of women uh, who want to use cannabis for its anti-nausea property for um, second trimester hyperemesis gravidarum. It is not approved for that and it can affect the fetus. So uh, yes, does it work for nausea? Yeah, but please use Zofran. Don't use THC, you know, because you're affecting the fetus. Half the women won't drink caffeine, but they'll light a joint, you know, so not okay. It's definitely THC. So THC has a mood stabilizing effect and also a neuroprotective effect. And for Alzheimer's patients, I have a half a dozen Alzheimer's patients and I have none that have quit. The family members love when their Alzheimer's patients are sundowning and they're having a lot of trouble with agitation and a lot of trouble with sleep. If you've ever taken care of an Alzheimer's patient, they wake up in the middle of the night and they start wandering. And if they can sleep better and they can have less anger and a great, you know, when you're struggling with memory and recall, you get agitated and cannabis seems to be mood stabilizing for them. So they, you know, grandpa needs an edible. Doesn't do anything for his memory though, as far as. Great question. Un unknown, you know, and so often when people ask me these questions, I tell them unknown. 
We need more evidence. This state-based program is a loophole and it's a workaround. And I think the 33 states that so far have approved this are forcing the government's hand. We're going to do this until you allow it to be rescheduled so it can be studied. Because there's benefit. The question is, is how much benefit, you know? And when I tell patients about using medical marijuana, I educate them that not everything is known. And you may use this and it may fail. And you may decide, I just wasted my money on this process. That's just a risk you take. So the benefits have to outweigh the risks. And when you're dealing with an Alzheimer's patient, then, you know, you got a huge span of benefit and a very low risk to an elderly patient that's struggling with memory. I had somebody, that's a great question, because I had somebody that was, uh, had a, uh, a brain injury, and they were, it hit the part of their brain that was really uh, uh, fearing, interfering with their short-term memory. And they wanted a medical marijuana card based on the fact that they had uh, uh, mood irritability and agitation due to a, uh, uh, a brain injury. But the problem is, is she wanted better memory, not worse. And you got to really talk about the risks of THC. We know THC affects the hippocampus. That's an area of your brain that helps with memory. So we don't want to impair that process of the brain. But a great question. I, uh, I wish there was more education in terms of Alzheimer's patients. Um, I have quite a few Parkinson's patients, and it's 50-50 with them when it comes to relieving the, uh, the dyskinesia movements and the tremor. A lot of them want relief of their tremor, but it just doesn't work that well for tremor. It, but I get feedback from patients that it is working for their tremor, but I just don't know if that's a placebo effect. They don't recognize it. But the dyskinesia is where the evidence really is. Dyskinesia means painful, spastic movement that they can't control. And that's where it helps the Parkinson's patients the most. Sorry, I digressed. So I left a lot of time for questions. So, you know, if you're not comfortable in a seat, I'll, I'll hang out a little bit afterwards uh, for more questions. Um, this is new. And uh, this is something that doesn't have uh, a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, when people have a qualifying condition, a lot of times they come in with experience. When they have no experience, it's a it's a uh, really a, a matter of trial and error for them. You know, especially pain patients. You know, uh, some it works great on, others it does nothing. And it's so hard when you have those patients that say it just doesn't do much. I have so much pain and I can't sleep, and cannabis really helps me sleep. I wish it would do more for my pain. So, uh, you know, I have the vast majority of my patients are pain patients that want relief of pain. And that's where I just don't, uh, I feel like it's helpful, but it's not what they want. They want something to cure their pain. And this is a management tool, you know. It doesn't, ni the nice thing about marijuana is you have all these youngsters using marijuana and then you have them graduating. They have no addiction. Marijuana is not addicting physically. You know, it affects the endocannabinoid system, but it doesn't seem to have much of a tolerance risk and an addiction risk. Does anybody know of anybody addicted to marijuana? Maybe psychologically, I can get addicted to ice cream. I've been addicted to ice cream. <laughs> it makes me feel good. Cannabis makes you feel good. So psychologically, you could become an addict, but it doesn't have the withdrawal symptoms like an opioid does. You know, it doesn't have the withdrawal symptoms that nicotine does, you know. So I think there are, there's a big wide margin of safety here that the government is literally creating reefer madness against. But the reefer madness that was created in this country was political, guys, not medicinal. You have doctors that are arguing against reefer madness and craziness. It doesn't do that, you know. It tends to be therapeutic in those ranges. This year, uh, three conditions are being uh, investigated by the uh, state medical board, uh, anxiety, uh, uh, autism, and also cachexia. So those might be three conditions that we add. Cachexia is loss of appetite. 
and when you are starving to death, like you can't, you can't develop hunger, and they want it approved for hunger creation. Um, did I sway anybody's? Did you learn something from this topic? I mean, does it seem like maybe we've had a little bit of a wrong thinking about this, you know? That, uh, so many people I come up to me and say, Bajwa, I totally disagree with you. Marijuana has no benefits. It just creates a bunch of high millennials. And I'm like, that might be your thinking, but the mo vast majority of my patients are over 65, you know? I mean, that's what they don't really get, you know? When you get older and you start struggling with some of the medical conditions that are on that list, you'll be thankful that the state approved this. And, and thankful that you don't live in uh, Minnesota, Indiana, Kentucky, or some of the other states that are not allowed to program.